Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Jerry, and in this episode, we are going to talk about the Persian Empire. So, when we left off, we didn't have a Persian Empire. We had four states that were fighting each other. We had Babylon and Mesopotamia, Egypt on the Nile in Egypt, Lydia in Western Asia Minor, and Media in what is today Iran and Afghanistan. How do we end up with the Persians uniting all of that and becoming the largest empire of the ancient Mesopotamian world? 25% of all humans who were alive in 500 BC lived in the Mesopotamian Mesopotamian, the Persian Empire. How did that happen? It's going to stretch from Europe to Egypt, to Mesopotamia, to India. In fact, even India, the Indus River, will be part of this empire. How? Why? Why does this happen? The Persians were the little cousins of the Medes. They weren't significant. They weren't important. So how does this happen? This happens because of Cyrus. Cyrus the Great in the 530s. Now repeat after me. Cyrus is the man. Now we're going to have a couple of guys, mostly guys, who are the man in this course. And Cyrus is one of them. How do I know he's the man? Because he even has a body wash named after him. Do you have a body wash named after you? It smells like citrus. Like, makes sense. The citrus groves of Mesopotamia. So even today, you can go and you can get yourself a Cyrus body wash. And this isn't like some weird Iranian thing. This is like in Sephora. So what makes Cyrus the man? Well, several things. The first of which is he's a great conqueror. An Alexander, a Caesar, and he conquers most of the known world at the time. He starts by defeating the Medes, who is his own granddad. Now, Cyrus has, a, has an entire origin story, like Superman or Batman. His granddad had a dream, a prophecy that his daughter would give birth to, um, well, to an octopus, actually. But the idea was to the conqueror of the world, to the thing that would overthrow him and destroy the, uh, the Median Empire. And so what this granddad does is try to avoid that prophecy from happening. And if you know anything about ancient world prophecies, you know the more you try to avoid them, the more you actually create them. And so the first thing he does is marry his daughter to a nobody in Persia. Now, you can't marry the, the princess of Media, one of the four great states of the ancient world, to like a farmer. Like, that doesn't work. So it has to be a nobleman. But he does marry his daughter off to a Persian nobleman, some second, second rank guy, sends her off to Persia, uh, basically relegating her to the minor leagues and figuring she's out of the picture. No problem. What then happens, though, is she gives birth to a son. And he remembers, uh oh, there's this grandson. So I'm going to try to kill him. So he sends a nobleman, a median nobleman, to kidnap the son and, and murder him. And this is the, the, the Oedipus story. This is Snow White. This is the guy kidnaps the son and goes off into the woods and is about to murder him and can't you murder a baby. So he can't murder the baby. So he goes to, finds a farmer and says, yo, farmer, you murder the baby or I'll murder you. 
And the farmer says, okay, this sucks. All right, come back tomorrow. And the nobleman says, fine, I'll come back tomorrow. So he goes home with this baby. And it turns out his wife has just had a miscarriage. She's given birth to a stillborn son. And so the wife says, ha ha, the gods have blessed us. In our sorrow, they've taken away one son, but they've given us another. So give him this son, this boy, our dead child, and we'll raise this other one and we'll be okay. We won't be murdered. So the husband says, that's great. Takes the stillborn son, goes to Nobleman, says, here's the baby. The Nobleman says, fine, great. Takes the baby, goes back. Uh, either goes back to the granddad or, or buries the son, the, the stillborn son, but either way goes back and says, the grandson is dead. No problem. And so the granddad is like, great. This is awesome. Prophecy taken care of. And goes about his day. Years pass. And if you've ever seen the first Superman, you know what happens. This boy has king's blood in him. He has his mom's princess blood and his granddad's king's blood. Now, in the ancient world, the cream rises to the top. You you couldn't... There, kings were better than regular people. In, in Egypt, as we're going to talk about, they're related to gods. So, so this young boy that's called Cyrus, turns out to be awesome at everything. He's the best running back and quarterback on his high school team. He's a champion debater and the champion wood whittler at the same time. He, he, everything he does, he leads his school. He does everything well. Because he's got king's blood in him. And so he rises to the top. And stories start to spread about this this boy Cyrus. This farmer's boy Cyrus. Who is amazing. Just like Superman in Kansas. Is like Clark Kent is like. I can't do. do you know. I can't, I can't show all of my powers. But I'm still pretty amazing. Or like um, Dash in The Incredibles. He has to hide his powers, but at the same time, it always comes through. And so the granddad takes notice of this because the granddad is always on the lookout for boys of talent that he can bring into his own and, and use uh, as, um, as future noblemen, as loyal servants. So he brings you know, this Cyrus and a bunch of other promising boys to the capital and um, in watching him do his training and all that, he realizes this is my grandson. And he's like, oh, grandson. And he's like, oh, granddad. And this is great. And then he realizes the nobleman didn't kill him. And so that's going to be a problem. So he's happy that he's got his grandson. But then he has the dream again about the grandson killing him and taking over the empire. And so... He does two things. The first is he tries to kill Cyrus and fails. And Cyrus runs away back to Persia. And the second thing is he hires the nobleman's son to be in his personal bodyguard. Now, that is a great honor. And the nobleman is extremely happy. My son is going to be like in the, in the secret service protecting the king. I mean, this is, that's, that's awesome. And a couple weeks pass, and the nobleman says, Yo, king, I, I, I haven't seen my grandson, my son. He's supposed to be part of the royal guard. Where is he? Oh, I sent him on a special mission. Top secret. Only him and a couple other dudes could do it. Big honor stuff. Huge reward. Oh, great. Why don't you... 
to celebrate this, have dinner with me. And the nobleman says, that's great. I'm going to have, I'm going to have time alone with the king. I'm going to be sitting there eating with the king. This is amazing. And the king's like, yeah, we have to talk strategy. We got to go get this Cyrus guy. Great. So they go and they have food and they're eating. And the king goes, how do you like to roast meat? And the nobleman's like, it's great. It's well salted. It's well spiced. Here, have some more. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. King. And he has some more. Would you like some more? Uh, I, well, I'm kind of full. Uh, have a little bit more. Okay, I'll have a little bit more. Thank you, Mr. King. This, this is great. We talk strategy. We're going to go get Cyrus. It's great. You know, um, I'm going to ask you, though, how, how is how's my son doing? Is he, is he, how's this mission going? Is it great? He's like, oh, it turned out amazing. He served the best role. Look down at your plate. And the dad looks down at his plate. He goes, you just ate your son. That's what used to be your son. Ha 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 ha. You said you killed Cyrus. You didn't kill Cyrus. You lied. So I killed your son and you ate him. Ha ha. The nobleman apologizes. Says you're right. I was wrong. I deserved this punishment. Let me make it up to you. And Cyrus, and not Cyrus, this, the Median king who's like, all right, I'm about to execute you because you're going to be insane because I just ate your, you just ate your son, is taken aback. He's like, wait, what? Huh? Who? Wait. You just ate your son and you're apologizing to me? Huh. And he's like, I took pity on a baby and I shouldn't have. And you're right. I should have been loyal to you above all things. Let me show that loyalty. Let me earn your trust. Give me command of the army to go kill Cyrus. You owe that to me. Let me finally fulfill that prophecy. I will murder your grandson. And the meaning king's like, that's great. This, oh, this turns out even better. I thought I was going to have to murder you, but now I, I don't have to. Sure, take, my, take an army. I'll give you 20,000 troops. You go. Cyrus doesn't have anything. And so the nobleman was just eating his son because the median king murdered the boy, takes an army of 20,000 and heads down to Persia. Now, in the meantime, Cyrus is riling up the Persians, being like, they're coming to get us. They're coming to get us. I know they're our cousins, but the Medians are coming. And then here comes the Median army. And so Cyrus gets himself a small little army of like 5,000, 6,000 troops. He doesn't have much. He goes to ride up to this nobleman. And a nobleman says, uh, do you know what you're, I was supposed to do? I was supposed to murder you once. And now I'm supposed to murder you again. And the Median king killed my son. And made me eat him unknowingly. What are you going to do about it? And Cyrus says, well, how about we both go back up to media and kill granddad? I mean, we could fight now or we could kill granddad. And the nobleman says, that's exactly what I was thinking. Let's go. And turns his 20,000 troops over to Cyrus. So both guys want revenge because... Cyrus is like, my granddad wants to kill me. All I wanted to do was be like, play catch with him. And he wants to murder me. And the nobleman's like, I want revenge. And revenge is a dish best served cold. The Klingons taught us this. Revenge is a dish best served cold. And so saying, I'll kill Cyrus. Ah, uh, give me an army is cold. 
There's no emotion in that. And so it goes down. Now Cyrus has a real army, 20, 30,000 troops. He gets more Persians because the Persians now know the Median. He was right. The Medians sent an army against him. So he now he's got 30, 50,000 troops. Marches up to Media with these troops, the, all these cavalry troops. Has a big battle against his granddad. Has a discussion across the battlefield. The granddad talks about the, 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 the prophecy, how he's tried to avoid the prophecy, and how the prophecy has marched Kind of like in Macbeth, how how the wood marches on uh, on Macbeth, and they have a battle, and Cyrus kills his granddad in the midst of the battle. That's Cyrus's origin story: becoming king of the Persians. Having won this big battle against the big cousin, the, 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 the Persians immediately declare him their leader, their king. Having defeated the, per, the Medes and being the grandson of the king of the Medes, he becomes king of the Medes. And in one fell swoop takes over one of the big empires of the world. This is his origin story. Like This is where he came from. That's how awesome Cyrus is. He has to have an origin story. He couldn't just be like a normal, regular king who was born to a king who pops up being a king. He has to have a story that you make movies out of. And so he becomes king of the Medes, having defeated his own granddad. He then gets attacked by the Lydians. The Lydians have a king, Croesus, C-R-O-E-S-U-S, -S, Croesus. And Croesus likes the Greeks. He has got Greeks in his army. He owns a part of the Greek colonies called Ionia, I-O-N-I-A. And he's got Anatolian cavalry. He's got some of the best cavalry in the world. And he's got some Greek footmen who aren't, who are all right at this point. They'll become great, but they're all right at this point. They're not the Greeks that we're going to get into in part two of our course. But he was what's called Philhellene. P-H-I-L-H-E-L-L-E-N-E. -E. He loved the Greek stuff. And so he goes, Croesus goes to the oracle at Delphi, the Greek oracle at Delphi. He goes, oracle, you tell the future. And the oracle goes, I know. And he goes, oracle... Tell me, I got this guy, Cyrus, on my border. Should I attack him? And the oracle, and remember, you always have to be questioning prophecies. The oracle says, if you attack Cyrus, you will destroy a great empire. And Croesus, who wants to be one of the great kings of the world, says, great, this is awesome. I, this is going to be fantastic. And he gets his army together of Anatolian cavalry, get some Greeks together. And he goes marching off to go fight Cyrus. He crosses the Halos River, goes into the world of the Hittites, what used to be the Hittite kingdom, into uh, eastern Anatolia to fight Cyrus. And they have a battle. In fact, they'll have two battles, one which will be disrupted because of a solar eclipse. Which freaks everybody out. It's like the gods are like, yoo time out. We darken the world. And everyone goes, whoa. But the Persians are, are cavalry. They're horsemen. They're, they're good at horses. But the Lydians might be better. And so in the second battle, the Lydians come charging in their, their horses. And Cyrus had noticed something back in Iran. He had noticed that his horses were terrified, I mean terrified, of camel pee, of the smell of camels, of camel pee, P-E-E, -E, pee, urine. And so what he had done, now imagine having this job, was collect barrels full of pee and line them all up in the front of his army. 
And as the cavalry comes charging and charging and charging, like out of Braveheart, they're charging at him, they get close, all those barrels are turned over. And so camel, the smell of camel pee fills the air. The horses smell it. They freak out. They go running away. Cyrus is able to win the battle fairly easily with his, with his super camel troops and his infantry. Comes rolling in, crushes everybody. He captures Croesus. No, actually, he'll capture Croesus later. Croesus runs away because he's defeated. Back to Greece. He goes and he's mad. He goes to the Oracle and goes, you told me I would destroy a great empire. And the Oracle says, you did. Your own. It's not my fault. You didn't ask which one. And it's like, oh. And then Croesus remembers that above the Oracle, uh, the entrance, the door of the entrance of the Oracle of Delphi is the words, know thyself. He should have known that he, one, wasn't a great commander, or, and two, um, was hubristic, thinking that the destruction of his the empire would automatically be Cyrus's, that he was that good. And so he goes back to Lydia, where he is captured by Cyrus, and then Cyrus makes him a governor, keeps him around, says, you... As king of the Lydians, know the Lydians the best. Be my governor of Lydia. And Cyrus, and Croesus says, okay. You mean you're not going to cut my head off? He's like, no, why would I do that? Because everybody cuts the heads off of the ex-kings. And Cyrus is like, I'm not everybody. And we're going to get to this. The third place he conquers is Mesopotamia. He conquers Babylon. And it's a, it, it's actually opens up its... its doors to Babylon. They want Cyrus to be their king. They're like, Cyrus, come be our king. We don't want to fight you. And he even conquers out what we call, what was called at the time Bactria, B-A-C-T-R-I-A, or what is today Afghanistan, that connection to Central Asia and India. So it's the connect for him, it's the connection to the Persian speaking nomads that are still out there in Asia, in the, in the Asian world, in the, in, in Central Asia. And so, uh, by conquering Afghanistan, he's keeping actually, uh, a connection to allies or possible allies, but he's also blocking up. He's putting a border up so that nomads don't come and invade him the way Persians and Medes did to the Assyrians. So you have this, he's a great conqueror. And even his conquests are like stories in Herodotus. H-E-R-O-D-O-T-U-S. Herodotus, the first historian, who writes the story of the war between the Persians and the Greeks. Well, in telling that story, he goes, well, I got to tell the story of the Persians so you know what the hell has been going on. So I have to tell the story of the Lydians and the Persians and all, and he tells these stories. So it's not, Cyrus is not just a dude. He's a dude that has stories connected to everything. Even his conquest of Afghanistan. He dies. He loses. And wins. Like he conquers Afghanistan and dies in the battle that does it. And his men are so uh, grieved. They keep fighting. They should run away. Like when a king or a general dies in the ancient world... People usually run away. They don't keep fighting. These guys kept fighting and won. That's how awesome Cyrus is. The second thing he is, is nice. He's nice. And we see this over and over again. How does Cyrus run the world? He's nice. How are the Persians going to run the world? They're nice. The first thing he did was marry a Median princess. He killed his granddad. He conquered the Medes. And the Medes are like, oh my God, you're going to now murder us, our little cousins, because this is what the Assyrians did. And Cyrus walks up and goes, no, I'm going to combine us. I'm going to marry one of your princesses, one of the, one of the noble princesses. I'm going to marry one. We're going to combine generals of Persia. Marry the daughters of the nobles of media. And the generals say, okay, if you say so, Cyrus, you're pretty cool. You've got a good idea here. 
And the noblemen of media say, well, that, this is way better than being murdered. Having, having my, my daughter slash grandson as a nobleman of the new Persian Cyrus empire uh, is going to be pretty cool for me. And so he combines the people. And so that they become interlocked, they become interwoven, so that it became a joke in Greece, the way you, we talk about splitting hairs, uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other, the way we use that as a joke, when someone's like, oh, well, that's not, uh, that color is not gray, it's charcoal slate, and you're like, six of one, half a dozen of the other, jerk. The Greeks had a joke, which was one man's Mede is another man's Persian. In fact, Herodotus switches between the two, calling the Persians, for the most part, the Medes. Because the Greeks were more familiar with the Medes than with the certain ethnic group of the Persians. And so they became interwoven. That's how close the two became. Like Tex-Mex food. Where's the Tex? Where's the mechs? Where does one end and the other begin? And if you've been to the Southwest, you know it ain't very clear. The two are interwoven on top of each other. He lets kings stay kings. So this is B. He lets kings stay kings. And he takes the title, a title Sargon had, a title that's, that's an ancient title in the Mesopotamian world, King of Kings. Now, you've heard that. If you're a Christian, you've definitely heard it. Um, because the last person referred to as a king of kings for Christians are going to be Jesus. But he lets kings stay kings. The king of Lydia, the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon fought a war against him. He beat him. In fact, his own people arrested the Babylonian king and turned him over to Cyrus. And Cyrus let him go. And it's like, yo, you walk back in there and you sit on your throne. You're the king of Babylon. You're the king Croesus. You're the king of Lydia. He let kings stay kings, keep their thrones. And he took the title king of kings. He was a king who told other kings what to do. That made him king of kings. And so that's nice. Why? Because he doesn't murder them, which means they get to stay kings. And if there's one job that is awesome in the world, it is king. You don't, the worst thing that could happen to a king is death. Because you're dead and you're not king anymore. And so, he gains the loyalty of these guys. Croesus likes Cyrus. Croesus' kids are going to like Cyrus because Croesus' kids would never be king if Cyrus murdered their dad. Because Cyrus would then, if the Assyrians were doing this, they would have murdered all of them. And so... He lets kings stay kings and gains their loyalty. Hey, Cyrus wants taxes? No problem. I can do that. I get to be king. Three. He lets enslaved people return home. And the most famous of these people are the Hebrews. So there's a story here. In five, we're going to talk about it, five... 78, the king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has a war with Egypt. Now remember, there's the four states that are all fighting each other, and two of the biggies are Babylon and Egypt. And so Nebuchadnezzar has a war with Egypt. Well, the Hebrews are in the middle of that. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes marching down smashes the Hebrews, destroys Jerusalem, s burns down the temple. Picks up the people, moves them to Babylon as slaves. He does essentially what the Assyrians did. He continues the Assyrian policy, Nebuchadnezzar. This is known as the Babylonian captivity, and this is going to be a big deal. This is a trauma for the Hebrews. Half the Hebrews will disappear in this time period, the next 50 or so years, the next two generations. This is where the Bible starts being written down because people, now that they're not connected to the um, 
temple and to the temple priests, this is they need to write this stuff down to remember it. They can't just have oral tradition anymore. They got to write down the laws. They got to write down this stuff. And so the Old Testament, the, the, the Torah and the Tanakh start getting written down so that they're remembered uh, and they're formalized. They're starting to be formalized. We start to get um, messianic prophets who are, who are, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, who are monotheistic and are like, you're going to destroy us. The only way to save ourselves is to, is to be loyal to the one true God. There are no other gods out there. So you get your messianic prophets. You, you get the core of what becomes Judaism, which is different than the Hebrew mosaic prologue that had been going on for about roughly a thousand years. So it's going to change. Rabbis are going to become more important. Um, the temple becomes less important and synagogues become important. Communities become important. The The idea of the... Um, that all you need is 10 Jews to have a ceremony. The misfa, I believe it's said. But it's the idea of the community. It's all, all you need is 10. Now, you may go, well, 10 sounds like a lot to have like a wedding, to have a bris, to have, you know, the, the baptism type thing. But the bris is not a baptism with water. It's the, it's the circumcision. But it's important to baby boys. It's an important ceremony. Uh, it's where you get your name. It's your name day. To have these ceremonies, to bury somebody, all you need is 10 for it to count in the eyes of God. Now, you may go, well, 10's a lot, but 10 is two families. That's it. Two families. And think about it. A death, a marriage, a bris. You're going to have two families. You're going to have the father's family and the mother's family. You're going to have, fam you're going to have 10 people. And so Judaism is in this period of slavery beginning to take the, the shape that it will encounter until basically the Middle Ages where it starts to become Europeanized and become modern, just like Christianity will. So, you know, neither one is, is what it was in 100 AD. So back to the, the Hebrews. So the Hebrews are slaves. And he comes and he does, he does, Cyrus sits on a throne in Babylon. Now remember what Babylon is. It's cosmopolitan city of the world. Everybody's there. So there are people Cyrus has never met. And he's like, who are you? And who are you? And what's that weird clothing? And who are you? What's that weird language? And he looks at these people and goes, you're kind of weird looking. Who are you? And they go, we're the Hebrews of Judea. And he says, what are you doing here? He's like, well, we are slaves. Nebuchadnezzar came, smashed our, our, our country, destroyed our city, destroyed our temple, and picked us up and moved us here as slaves. And Cyrus says, well, would you like to go back? And they say, yeah, we'd love to go back. But we have no money. We have no carts. We have no horses. We're slaves. And Cyrus says, I will give you the carts, and I will give you the horses, and I will give you the money to return. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank, thank, thank you, um, Cyrus, king, super king of kings, super king, um, but we also had it all, we had a city, and never because I was burned it down, I will help you rebuild the city, was it big, was it awesome, <gasps> well, it, it's not this, it's not Babylon, but it was pretty cool for us, we're small people, we're okay, well, then I will build it. Here, let me give you the money. Let me give you the architects. Let me give you the stone. You will have Jerusalem back. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Cyrus, sir. Um, but we also had a temple. 
Was it a big temple? Well, it we only have one god. And- <laughs> one god? <laughs> no wonder you're slaves. How do you fight a battle with only one god? I've got 12. And then they have 12. You went into battle with one god? Well, he, he he's our god. He chose us. It's a, it's he it's a thing. We understand. We know. We're a silly people, but we 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 had a temple. Was it an awesome temple? Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty awesome temple. Well, then I will help rebuild it. Here, take more architects. Take more stone. Go and have your one god temple. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they go and they build the second temple. The second temple that Jesus will become Kung Fu Jesus in when he beats up the money changers is Cyrus's temple. Now, it's not called Cyrus's temple. It's called the temple of Herod because Herod is going to be king of the Jews. He's going to be a Jewish king who's going to add a lot to it. But Cyrus helped the Hebrews rebuild that temple. He helped them rebuild Jerusalem. He was a foreign Persian king who helped them rebuild. And for that, he's called a Messiah. Now think about that. A Messiah is a person now, it's, it, there's, there's the, the word Messiah just means anointed by God. So it means like thousands of things. The thousands of things are called Messiahs. But in terms of people, named people who are called Messiahs are rare. If I remember correctly, there are 11 named Messiahs. Only one of them is not Hebrew. And guess who that guy is? It's Cyrus. That is awesome PR. That is, you are a guy sent by the Jewish God to save the Jewish people. That is awesome. Are you a Messiah? I'm not a Messiah. Even Jesus isn't a Messiah. Jesus is a nice Jewish boy who had some good thoughts and, you know, If uh, we're generous, we'll raise him to prophet status. But he's not a Messiah in the Jewish faith. He's a Messiah in the Christian faith. He's not a Messiah in the Islamic faith. He's a prophet. So Cyrus is a Messiah. And we see this in Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, he's named, he's named, whom he has taken by his right hand to subdue nations. Now that's important. Why? Because the right hand is the strong hand. To sit at the right hand of the father is to be the most important person. It is, right? Jesus at the right hand of God. So has taken him by his right hand, his strong hand. So Cyrus is important to the Jewish God to subdue nations before him and strip the loins of kings, to force gateways before him that their gates be closed no more. I will go before you leveling the heights. That's the Tarsus Mountains. That's a reference to the Tarsus Mountains, the mountains that separate Lydia, Asia Minor, from Mesopotamia. I will shatter the bronze gateways. That's Babylon. Babylon was famous for these 60-foot tall, massive doors through its gates. I will shatter the bronze gateways. I will smash the iron bars. I will give you the hidden treasures, the secret hoards, that you may know that I am the Lord. So not only in Isaiah does the God of the Jews call Cyrus a messiah, He then says, I'm taking him by my right hand. I am going to help you cross the Tarsus Mountains. I am going to help you destroy Babylon. And then God, I'm going to make you rich. And then God mic drops. When you, when, whenever you are reading your Old Testament and you see that you may know that I am the Lord, he is, boom, he is mic dropping. That is Yahweh's mic drop. 
He never says it unless he wants to make his point absolutely clear that this is what he wants, this is how he wants it, and this is what it's going to be. Boom. He, he, he dropped a boom hammer. That's why it's kind of funny as an aside to the modern world. That modern Jewish politicians, modern, I shouldn't say Jewish, modern Israeli politicians like Netanyahu talk about how the Persians and the Jews are ancient enemies. They're not. In fact, the Persians are probably the greatest champions of Jews. Much better than Greeks, much better than Romans and Christians. There's an apocryphal story, the, the, the Ruth story, right? Esther story, where there's an unnamed Persian king who wants to murder all the Jews. And she saves the people. Historically, there is none. Not Cambyses, definitely not Cyrus, who is a uh, messiah. And not Darius. None of them want to murder all the Jews. They don't even want to convert to Jews. They don't want to do anything with the Jews but get the Jews to work for them. And pay them to do so. And so when Netanyahu goes and he meets with Barack Obama and says, Look, here's the book of Esther where the Persians tried to murder all of us. And this is true today. I was sitting there going, well, that's a shitty thing to do. And Obama should be like, well, here's the book of Isaiah where he... The Persians are called messiahs. Which is it, dude? Here's the book of Jeremiah. Here's the book of Daniel. Every time the Persians are seen as good guys. Why? Because the Persians are nice. Now, remember, the Old Testament is not history. It's not. It's not history. It's not written to be history. It's stories. It's morality tales to help people understand the world they're living in. It is not history as Thucydides or Herodotus will write with a thesis, with evidence. The Old Testament is the story of people's relationship with God. That's what it is. And it's trying to answer those questions that people have of that relationship. That's its goal. How to live the good life. How to, what does God want? It is not history. It was never meant to be history. Read your chronicles. Read your kings. It's a list of stuff they do. And it's usually a list of terrible things that they do that pisses off God. Or it's God intervening to help them. It's not a study of man's behavior, causes and effects and reactions. And so, the Bible doesn't try to do that. So people who say, oh, this is exactly what happened, is they're not. That's not exactly what happened. And it's not why it happened. And that's not the job it's meant to do. It's different than history. So, Cyrus is the Messiah is not the Messiah, a Messiah, because there are multiple ones. He's a Messiah. That's great PR. He is nice. So that will bring us to Cambyses, the son of Darius, who's going to be different and who we're going to talk about next. Thank you.